Hello everybody, welcome. I'd like to talk to you today a bit about maker education, maker ed, maker centered learning. My slides are available to you at that bit.ly 2023 maker ed part one. My name is Paul Shercliffe. I've been in education for about 25 years, mostly in classroom teaching physics and math, but now lately it's, uh, trying to help people do uh, more maker ed kind of things. My Twitter is Shirky17, my website is my name, paulshirkliff.org, and my email is paul at paulshirkliff.org. I want to give you a little bit of a description of Make Red, some of the ideas of it, and then give you some classroom examples. Maker-centered learning, this Make Red idea, is not new. It is really just the pedagogies we were told about years ago that were good. Things from Dewey, things from Montessori, Vygotsky, Piaget, Papert, just mash them up and they are the pedagogy that we you know, were trying to get to. Um, it's not one more thing to add to your plate, it's a shift in how you're doing things is usually what's, got, what, what's going to be. At the core is an artifact. Designing, creating, building, making some kind of an artifact. Um, and around that, from that, through that, are discussions. And those discussions are the content that we weave in. Uh, the discussions can be you and one student, you and a small group of students, the students with each other. Um, but it's those conversations, those discussions. That's where the content gets in there. You know, while we're making, while we're designing, while we're creating, while we're implementing, testing, prototyping, iterating. You know, we're thinking about it kind of like we, you know, we're making in order to learn, and we're also learning to make. The learning and assessment actually happens in those conversations. Uh, it's a multitude of conversations, different conversations you have with different students. You don't have to have the same conversation with each student because they come from different points of view, different perspectives. They're all different places. you got to find where they're at and bring the conversation um, to them and take it forward from there. We also want to emphasize the process of the design and creation over the, the product. Um, just getting a physical product done is, is not the be all end all. Yes, we want them to be able to make something, be able to complete something um, and, and feel that accomplishment, but it doesn't always, always happen. Sometimes it fails a lot and that's just part of the nature of, of learning. That there's sometimes sorry, but so much learning uh, can happen through that. Uh, we also don't always have time uh, to get everyone to the finished product point because um, things just happen along the way sometimes. So you, you've got to blend, figure out how to blend that. But through all those conversations, the one-on-one, -on -one, the one-on-two, the listening to what they say to each other, that's the learning and the assessment. Maker-centered learning activates multiple parts of the brain at the same time so it's kind of and it connects them so it's a naturally transcurricular um, it kind of blends and, and meshes everything uh, together which that's where the real learning happens because it's in context it's not separated from the reality of things that's what really helps things to stick and to anchor that's why the learning is so much better Everybody knows something that you don't know, and it's good to understand it, even kids. I mean, kids know lots of things. Like, we were making these uh, puzzle cubes one time, and uh, you make them out of wood, glue, glue certain pieces together uh, to make different shapes, and they become a 3x3x3 uh, three by three by three cube. And, you know, we were painting them, coloring them. Uh, kids were doing different things, you know, to, to jazz them up a little bit. And one kid asked if they could hydro dip them. I'd never heard of hydro dipping. So I was like, yeah, what do you need for it? And they told me, I said, well, yeah, look around the room, find what you need and go to it. Well, they just, they just really just needed a bucket and they had some uh, fingernail polish and they drop it, you know, put some water in, in the, in the, in the bowl, uh, which was a beautifully clean bowl before they did that, but that's okay. Uh, drop some fingernail polish in and, and dip things in. And it was great because once they did that, somebody else wanted to do it. So they showed them how to do that. So in a maker-centered learning environment, everyone is a teacher and everyone's a learner. Uh, it's called distributed teaching and learning. It just feels great when they all get to show off something that they know how to do. 
one of the big advantages of Makerette is that there's so many ways of making. I mean, it's just endless. I mean, there's songs, there's 3D printing, there's coding, there's woodworking, there's painting, there's sculpting, there's laser cutting, there's uh, cricket, there's sewing. There's, there's just so many ways. They're endless that hopefully everybody can find like their thing, their niche. Uh, now, it also makes it the tough part because there's so many ways of making. You can't be expected to be the expert on all of them. You, you're not. You kind of have to give up a little bit of control and be good at being the learner and you know, exploring the unknown. Um, modeling how to learn. I mean, that's a really important thing to do. So they should all be able to find something that, that they can latch on to um, and find their way of doing things. You know, I was working, we were working one time on you know, this activity, this learning experience, and I had one student talk to me about, you know, what they had learned, what they had done so far, where they had gotten, uh, where they were going to, and what they had to do next. And there was a nearby student, uh, just though where it doesn't need to just not, you know, just not necessarily pay attention to what they were doing, not paying attention much, but heard that and said, hey, I can help them do that next part because I've already done it. And that was like awesome because that student that wanted to help usually have kind of kept themselves and kind of really didn't, you know, struggle to get things done. But now they got to be the expert and help someone else do something. Um, so that agency and empowerment that happens through this. I was like, yeah, God, show them how to do it. Give them help. And they, you know, it, it just it's just such a great feeling for them and it's such a great feeling for us to see that. Maker-centered learning is really student-centered. It's student-focused. It comes from their point of view, comes from their perspective. It also allows them the path they need to get to the learning. There's multiple paths to the learning. Um, sometimes they go backwards, but, you know, hey, that's that's learning. Um, so it just naturally does it because they get to, you know, sometimes choose uh, the mode, the modality, the tools, the materials, you know, which pieces they want to focus on. Uh, so it's really good at doing that. You know, we're not doing cookie cutter learning here, that they're all, you know, not recipe, they're all producing the same thing. They're all getting learning that they need to get, yes. But they're getting it their way, in, what, in their manner. It's kind of like giving each person an on-ramp their own on-ramp to uh, the learning superhighway kind of thing. You know, when we were doing uh, Newton's Laws, we had to make mousetrap cars. You know, like, hey, here's some parts. We've got to put together these to make a car that goes seven meters. I mean, you know, it's funny because that kid that wants to be the engineer, you, you can you kind of get a feel for who that is because they seven's not good enough. They got to go the farthest of everybody else. So you get to have different conversations with that student while still having all the Newton conversations we needed to have. And the kid who wants to be the artist, you know, wants to have, hey, can I paint it? Can I design it? Can I put some stickers on this? Can I put flames on this? Can I, yeah, let's do that. And, and by letting them do that, it opens up the brain for the conversations. It opens up those multiple parts of the brain. And we can have those conversations about art, design, uh, you know, ergonomics, but also the Newton stuff that we need to, that we have to try to try and get. So that's the great advantage to this. It comes from their perspective, their point of view. Now, maker-centered learning, maker ed, it fosters all the C's that we talk about. Now, I get kind of annoyed sometimes because a lot of people want to talk about four C's of education, creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And I, I think they're, they're really bad and that we, we keep leave, leaving off the C that's most important, the C that starts them all, the C that leads them all, and that's curiosity. Uh, you can come up with lots and lots of Cs, character education, citizenship also, but man, it starts with curiosity. Um, but creativity, really important for our culture, for our society, for our world right now, because there's lots of issues out in the world that need some creative solutions. And, you know, here's a nice little thing that Sylvia Duckworth put together from a presentation someone gave about what are the benefits of creativity. You know, it's multidisciplinary. You get to express yourself. It promotes thinking. Reduces stress and anxiety. People talk, schools talk a lot about social-emotional learning. Maker-centered learning, makerspaces, making. It's just, you know, good for our brain, good for our mind, good for our social, uh, social emotional health. Uh, get a sense of purpose, can link you with others with the same passion. You find people who like things that you like. 
that you never would have known before. I mean, that's some awesome things here. Um, and making it just good for us. Like I said, social emotional. Dan Ryder shared on Twitter about a student who'd made uh, this chessboard. And I don't know if they made it for special class or just any class kind of thing. Uh, but they made this and they were just walking down the hall showing off to people. Hey, look at this thing I made. Look at this chessboard I made. It's mine. I made it. I created it. Look how awesome this is. And it's a pretty good looking thing. Um, but, you know, it gives that, you know, that feeling of satisfaction, that accomplishment. You know, it's just good for our spirit, as Dan said. Now, we're talking about a mindset we're trying to create, a, a thing of... I can try new things, I can fail at some things, and it's okay because I'm just going to iterate and do some, try something different. I can have an impact on the world. I can make things that influence the world, that impact the world. I can make things that help people. Um, I can design and create um, for myself, for others. We're about creating this mindset uh, of, of being, being able to do something and have impact. That's a pretty big mindset. And when the kids develop this mindset, John Spencer made this out. You know, they become problem solvers. They think divergently. Uh, they're ready for the creative economy. Uh, they're explorers. They're engaged in learning. Creative risk takers. Assist, you know, hackers. Rebels. Empathy, too. Right? Again, they you know, design and create something for, to help somebody else. That's always a great uh, project idea. You know, that empathy that comes from that. So... You know, this maker mindset is, is, is a really great thing to, to help develop. Dale Doherty, who started Make Magazine years ago, had, you know, has always said, you know, we we're all born makers. We're all makers. We, you know, as a kid, we were makers. We made mud pies. We made stick forts. You know, we used, you know, sticks to play army. We built with blocks. We had blanket forts. You know, we make to understand the world. And then for some reason, we stopped that somewhere in school and then wonder why we can't understand the world. It just, we know why we can't, because we stopped making. Um, so we're all makers. So everybody's a maker of some kind. So think about what kind of a maker are you? What do you uh, make, create? Uh, you know, I've always been into gadgets and tech, and a few years ago I got into woodworking. I've always been into you know playing around the yard. Uh, I plant things that don't necessarily guard. I put things on the ground and hope they come up. Um, but then the next question is, how can you incorporate that into your learning experiences that you create for your students? Because it's nice to use a part of yourself, something that you know well. Um, so I asked that of some other teachers. And, you know, there's baking, uh, karagami. I didn't even know what that was. I still don't know what that is. Um, I forgot what that is. I did look it up. I forgot. Beadwork, bracelets, scrapbooking, um, stickers, cooking. I mean, there's so many clothes, origami. Uh, there's so many things that I could see have real easy uh, steps into the classroom and in multiple subjects. So, you know, that's the, the thing. We're all makers. Uh, now, you're probably already doing some making in your classroom. And I asked, you know, again, a bunch of teachers, you know, they make roller coasters, they're making butter, they make tamales. You know, oh, yeah, food. I mean, it's a great, a great thing to, you're studying cultures, you're studying histories, you're studying societies. Well, they all have different food. They also have different jewelry. I think is an interesting thing. Pinhole photography, sundials, dream catchers, I mean imagery, origami ornaments, rockets. I mean, there's so many ways that we do it. But here's an important thing, an important distinction. Um, is the making the avenue to the learning? Is it is it our vehicle through which we're learning or is it a culminating activity? Maker Ed is, it, in Maker Ed, it's not a culminating activity. It is the thing that we, how we do our learning. Uh, it's not just a project at the end when we get time, if we get time, and maybe we'll get to it kind of thing. So it's not the culminating activity. It is th how we're doing the learning. So that might be a twist that you got to make. Um, so here's some examples. Uh, we all get kids that can't measure. I think it's because they didn't have to make the measuring device. They don't know what those tick marks mean. They just see them, and we tell them what they are, and we give them paper handouts, and all of a sudden, have them make make the measuring devices. Now that could be um, on paper, it could be um, in Tinkercad, in Cricut, in this little studio, in uh, uh, Inkscape, whatever. And they get to talk about well, how many how many tick marks do you need? Is whole numbers enough? Do you need half? Do you need quarters? Do you really need sixteenths? 
do you really do you really need millimeters or centimeters good enough do you what do you need you get to have those conversations and they get to personalize their own little device which is always nice um so i think they got they've got to make their own measuring devices i saw somewhere on facebook that some kid uh made measuring cups and a one cup was a whole cylinder a half cup was half a cylinder a quarter cup was a quarter cylinder it was genius um proportion scale they gotta make stuff they gotta make models now whether they make them in 3d design and just leave them there or or export them from tinkercad into a vr world where they make them out of cardboard where you make them out of paper they gotta make stuff that's important geometry we deal with shapes all the time so they gotta build them now whether you build them with pipe cleaners and coffee stirs or you uh, just use straws, or you yeah, go full blown and buy PVC and make seven foot tall geodesic domes. Um, you you gotta you gotta make you gotta build. We did that. We split the class in half. One half had to make one dome. One the other half had to make the other dome. Um, I got them ten, 10 foot PVC. They had to measure and cut. Um, but they also had to create a marketing plan for whether this was a uh, um, a tool shed a toy shed a greenhouse or um or a tent kind of thing um so they had to you know create a flyer they had to create a commercial uh they had to build and the neat thing was they kind of split up in, into into jobs i didn't tell them what which jobs they had to take i said here's the jobs you got to get done so they kind of split up and then the people who were doing the um the, the artwork kind of stuff got bored and wanted to do some cutting and, and some building and that was and they oh okay I built I know some people doing the cutting went over and helped with you know the the uh, with the artwork kind of thing so they kind of shifted around and saw a bit of each other and that was great you know I, I, I th it just worked out awesome um, but they gotta build stuff they really do you know physics we study motion a whole bunch they gotta build stuff that moves whether it be mousetrap cars or hovercrafts, but you don't just give them a, a worksheet for them to fill in. You say, build something you know, that moves and it's got to move so far and then we got to measure stuff. And I didn't tell them exactly what to measure, but I said, no, we want to talk about speed. We want it, so what, do we, what can we measure to, to do this? And how many measurements are enough? And did you get good measurement? And we get to have conversations. You know, I didn't give them just a checklist thing to, to fill out. Uh, hovercraft is always nice if you give them an extension cord that's too long and they run into the wall uh, they don't get hurt um, but then it's like why do you keep running into the wall don't you understand friction yet and they eventually learn it you know buoyancy build boats build them out of foil build them out of paper uh, then go to card game start with cheap easy materials and move and move up you don't have to 3d print you can build them out of other stuff I've seen I've, I've loved when I've seen um, schools that actually have pools and uh, they have to build a boat for them and a friend, uh, or two, two teammates have to row across the pool. And not everybody makes it because the, their boat sinks. You know, biology, we're talking about biomes. Uh, so have them make the biome. Uh, mine was well, they had to do uh, 10 plants, 10 animals, pick a biome, and talk about all these different you know, pieces, parts of the biome. So just so while they're drawing, and one painted, uh, there's drawings. Um, we were talking about their animals, their plants, and what role they played, and and why they picked that one. Um, you know, one girl, the girl did this drawing over here. We're like, oh my cat, my camel's really bad. And the camel's kind of here in the bottom, bottom right. I said, yeah, the camel's not too good, but man, that cactus is awesome, and those mountains look great. You know, so we get to have these conversations. You know, some wanted to build a diorama. That's fine. Uh, some built websites that's great we had conversations and then i had my cricket in school so we said hey do you want to make a sticker of your favorite animal from your biome and like oh some kids like yeah okay so they got a you know sticker for uh their their chromebook or for their phone and we got to have more conversations about their animal in the process of them uh you know getting the file getting the file to the right place making it pe peeling it weeding it da -da 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 -da. and then we just happened to put up all the negatives um on a piece of paper just to show off what we were doing and yes there are a few disney princesses because you know the kids were done and no one was using the cricket and they said hey can i make yes sure go ahead we also 3d printed some keychains because i had the 3d printer there for some kids who wanted to 3d print their animal awesome biology has to do genetics 
Um, so, you know, design monsters, um, design mythical creatures. They could draw them. They could uh, do Tinkercad. Um, I, could think, I could see doing this with felt, uh, maybe a little bit of sewing. You could make plushies, um, all sorts of ways that, that they've got, that, that, that they could make these things to talk, have the discussions about genetics. Um, science always does earthquakes. Uh, start with, you know, spaghetti and marshmallows. Move up to straws and something else, you know. Start inexpensive materials and then move move your way up. They gotta build. There are tons of board games out there. I mean, history is rife with them. Um, but besides ones you could buy, they can design and make their own board game to um, study parts of history. Uh, the biology teacher next to me year for years, um, he had a they did a once a year. And they had to make a board game for a certain uh, unit. And I forget which unit it was. So it's not just history. It's it's across. It's across the curriculum that they can make board games work because they got to make the board, they got to make the rules, they got to make the pieces, they got to make the cards. So it's all sorts of things that go into this. You don't have to 3D print. I mean, it can be bottle caps to make the pieces. I mean, seriously. But if you got a 3D printer and if you got a laser cutter, okay, you can do some more with it. But yeah, it's just paper and cardboard is all you really need. Now, Roman history, there's a lot of science with, with, the, with the tools and the wars and the, and the, the machinery of war that they could make. Uh, the left is actually when we did trebuchets and physics. And for a couple years, I did it, and it was like, make it full size, do it, out, do it at home, and bring it in. And it wasn't working great. I, I didn't understand why. Um, I mean, it, it happened, and we, got, we did some things. The kids had some fun. Uh, but it was too much, I think, of one you know, one parent helping so much and the kids not getting together. Uh, so after a couple of years, we went to doing it in, in the classroom. And now I know why it worked better when it was in the classroom, because we could have the conversations while they were building. Again, it's about the conversations you can have. Um, you know, you got to study some societies, build them. You know, history is literally the, the studying the, the creation of civilization. So let's build a civilization. Build the jewelry. I mean, every every place has their own kind of jewelry for a certain reason. I mean, that should be part of it. Uh, so yeah, build the city. Build the build the make the jewelry. Have the conversations while you do that. English. I mean, we're talking lots of imagery ideas and how to demonstrate imagery. Um, Kim Stanley. They were studying this book, Just Mercy, and their student made a. Um, this beautiful lampshade. I mean, literally, you just they just you know, cut things off on a cricket and made a made a lampshade to show the imagery that comes that was important to the book. Um, you could do it with little tea lights kind of thing that could be made out of paper. Simple thing that they could cut by hand or cut on a cricket, or if they had a laser cutter, they could cut or they could three D print the thing. But you know, you use an imagery now. Obviously, those images on the right, bottom right, they're not uh, imagery from a book. They're just patterns. Um, but you could easily create that lampshade concept as a um, tea light. So imagery is really important. Poetry. David Thoreau takes the kids around and have them take pictures of poems. And they get back together and they crop pictures to um, make poetry. Dan writers in English class, they do, they read of Mice and Men. So the project became Design a Tiny House that meets the needs of the, of, the, of the men in the story. So they had to justify everything in their tiny house based on the story that they were reading. Talk about authentic assessment. I think that that's awesome. And they had to make models of this stuff. So I mean, just so many ways. I mean, coding and robotics, um, again, back in, you know, if you're studying history, there's, you know, mosaics and tiling and patterns that are specific to different cultures that can be done via coding. Um, we also get the math in there for some of the patterns and symmetry. Coding and robotics can be utilized to animate scenes from stories. I read it, there was a, like a sixth grade class that did robotics, and they went down and partnered with the second or third grade class who was reading a story, and they animated a scene from the from the second graders' uh, story. Uh, they helped the second graders do that, so they kind of worked together. A nice collaboration. Uh, so, you know, you can do cutting robotics for, for that to animate things. Fashion, again, when well, I said jewelry for studying civilizations or just things the kids like to make, um, you've got 3D printing, you got laser cutting, you got cricket to make stuff on t-shirts, uh, you got turtle stitch to do embroidery. 
that's you know coding that can be gotten get into the different fashions different areas uh, I think gardening you know outdoor gardening indoor gardening um, so many things again every culture has different different foods that while you're ta- while you're planting your food that grows in your area you can have the conversations about what grows natively in these other cultures why these other cultures grew this food or have this food uh, it's real, I think it's important to have gardens uh, John Umikubo does uh, these layer designs with his students. Now, they they work small in, the, in literally Altoid tin boxes. Um, but you don't have to work small, and you don't have to work with a laser cutter. You can do this out of cardboard. You can do this out of paper. Yeah, I mean, you're making, you're making scenes. So, again, we could talk about history and civilizations. We could talk about scenes from a story, scenes from a movie, from a book. Uh, we could talk about, hey, just make a scene and then write a story about it. Um, some neat ways to do this, and they also add lights to these. So they got some electronics there, because again, we're after conversations. You're making something, and we're going to have conversations about it, and, and we're going to weave in the conversations we need to weave in, uh, based on our content. You're also trying to create a culture. You're not just trying to create a, create a room or a one-time event. You're trying to create a culture again, that maker mindset that you want to develop. So it's gonna help if you scatter um, creativity opportunities around the building. Uh, the one on the left was uh, kids could put together a computer. And then if it worked, they got you know a, some kind of a prize from the principal. Or just you know magnet tiles, uh, pool noodle, light brights, graffiti boards, uh, real expensive light bright, Lego walls, uh, what, were the, what are the other walls you could put up? Um, marble runs, I mean, different things to, to the creativity. Some origami challenges, some straw challenges, green screens. Get some stuff up around the building. Don't forget outdoor spaces also. Opportunities for creativity. Utilize your outdoor and showcase your students' work. If, if they're just doing it and turning it in and no one else sees it, it it's not going to matter that much. But you get it around the hallway, you get it on, on websites, you get it on you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Uh, now it's going to really matter. And I think all the signing signage around the, around the school should be made by the kids. Uh, whether it's stickers, whether it's wood cutting, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's whatever. Um, let the kids make, make signs. Um, you know, I, I, saw, I had a friend that the, the kids had to design the mailbox name signs for all their teachers, for the mailboxes in the office. Great idea. Interview the teacher. Find out about them. Make a teacher room sign. Now, learning's messy. Making is messy. Uh, you get, and that's just going to happen. Messes are going to happen. So we get... Cleanup has got to be part of it. Kids have to understand that. There's not one straight linear path to learning. That's the other part of learning is messy. So it, 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 takes something, it takes time to get used to this. And it takes time to do it. True learning takes time. And everyone is at a different pace. Everyone's at a, going a different way about it. And so it's, you got to figure out how to give everybody enough time and give everyone enough support and the support they need to get this done. It, it, it takes it takes practice storage is the number one issue for anyone doing maker you've got to come up with a plan and uh, go with it and then maybe revise it I suggest lots of portable stuff I suggest lots of totes that are clear uh, that you can label with pictures and with words um, shelving for materials shelving for projects um, adjustable shelving I saw a neat one, and I should have put a picture here of like a bakery rack that you could utilize because you could do different height storage in a bakery rack. Whereas if you buy a shelving unit, it's it's a, it's stuck at a certain height because um, kids make different height projects. So storage, there you just got to figure out ways to store the stuff and store the projects. How do you do this? You start with one. You start with one project. Maybe you take that prod, that that content that you don't love so much, and it's the hardest for you to get excited about, and you tweak that to a maker project, a maker-centered learning activity, and then as Chris Kringle says, you put one foot in front of the other. 
there's some hashtags to follow. Um, sometimes it's makerspace, sometimes it's makerspaces. Uh, usually if you're in TweetDeck, you can do an or to get that. Um, Maker Ed, STEM is very much wrapped up in Maker, and Maker is very wrapped up in STEM. So follow some hashtags. Learn from others. Network. You know, if, if you're not sure why to do Maker, the, the, ten, the skills for, the, for jobs from World Economic Forum, those top 10 skills are all cultivated through Maker-centered learning. So that's what we're trying to create as kids who can, you know, contribute to the to the world, to the future, to make the, make us a better place. Thanks for hanging with me. There's again my contact information. There again is the uh, Bitly link to the slides. Have a great day.